the presiding officer of the Senate who will preside at this joint session. much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the joint session will come to order. I note uh, the presence of Acting Chief Judge Anthony Canatero and the esteemed jurist of the Court of Appeals, uh, joined by Chief Administrative Judge Tomiko Amerker. Welcome. Also note the presence of our statewide elected officials and legislative leadership. I will now introduce them and ask them to take their seats. Please welcome Controller Thomas P. DiNapoli. Please welcome Attorney General Letitia A. James. Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins. Also, like to note the presence of the distinguished members of the governor's administration. Uh, and I'm joined on the rostrum today by Secretary to the Governor Karen Keogh and Counsel to the Governor Elizabeth Fine. Please give a warm welcome to our mayors and county execs who have joined us in the chamber today. And finally, I also want to say a special hello to New York's second lady, my love, Lacey Schwartz Delgado. Please stand as we welcome the color guard of honor. It is my honor to welcome Reverend W. Franklin Richardson, pastor of the historic Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, to bless this session. I would invite us all now to go to the center place of ourselves, beyond our titles and beyond our destinies beyond our associations, but the center place of our humanity where all of us find common ground. 
We take away our prejudices and our status and center in to the only supreme, though multiple in its names and multiple in his presentations, is at the heart of who we are. Let us pray. O oh God, our mother and our father, we thank you for ordering our steps into this sacred space, this, this temple of governance. We, I, we invite you to be in our midst. We thank you for the journey and the legacy of this great empire state. We thank you for all those who have deposited their service, whether in building bricks fresh from the slave quarters, or climbing to places of prominence and power as legislators, and senators, and governors. We recognize your fingerprints upon our humanity, its marvelous diversity. Help us to be able to celebrate our diversity without difference or division. Help us to find common ground. Help this gathering of leaders who govern this state to move upon the great legacy they have inherited and push us to a day of equality and justice for all. Help us to climb over our selfishness and our divisions and find a singular purpose that will honor you. We thank you that you have provided in this hour the competent hands and compassionate heart of Kathy Hochul. We pray, God, that you will give to her the competency she needs to move this forward. As she sits in the helm of this ship of state, may those who share the bearing of the oars, may they find also the opportunity to move us forward. The days ahead will not be easy. There is turbulence and storm on the frontier. But we know that we can get through because we've been through. We know because you have carried this state through many difficult times. And we know in the end, we will get through these. But until that time comes, help us to find our importance as a part of partnership and community. And then God, help us to know that our time is short. Not one of us here has a continuing invitation or a continuing election to the space we now occupy. Soon, our sons and daughters shall come and claim our spaces. And may when they come, may, not, may they not see that we poured our blood for nothing and understand that the greatest title of all is servant. So make of us this wonderful governor, this governor who comes in a special time and in a special place, this governor who comes new in terms of having a woman at a place, at the highest place of this state. May that be a reflection on our progress may it not be contaminated by our exclusion or our prejudice. In the mighty and matchless name of a name that is called, of a God who is called in multiple expressions, whether Muslim or Christian or Jew, we thank you for this space. Help us to use it well. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, let's please welcome Major General Denise Donnell, first woman assistant adjutant general and first woman commander of the New York Air National Guard for the Pledge of Allegiance.
the honor guard, well, thank you, Major General. Will the honor guard please retire the colors? Pursuant to a resolution duly adopted in each of the houses of the legislature, the Senate and the Assembly of the State of New York are met in joint session for the purpose of receiving the annual message to the legislature from the governor of the State of New York. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud and honored to present the 57th governor of the State of New York, Kathy Hochul. Thank you, first of all, to my incredible partner in government, our Lieutenant Governor, Antonio Delgado. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Just like me, he knows every restaurant, every McDonald's on the throughways, and uh, he is traveling the state and doing an extraordinary job. I'm so grateful to have him. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Richardson for the beautiful invocation reminding us of the presence of God in our lives as we do the work of the people. I also want to thank my incredible partners in government. And in New York, we have extraordinary, extraordinary public servants. Our Attorney General, Tish James, who never backs down from a fight. Our great Attorney General, thank you. Our State Controller, Tom Benapoli, who's going to help us weather the financial storms that may lie ahead. And he's a great partner to get the state through some tough times, possibly. Our, our Senate Majority Leader, Andre Stewart-Cousins, we stood here a year ago and made history of relegating the three men in the room to a past concept. 
and I thank her for her friendship. Uh, our Speaker of the Assembly, Carl Heasty, we've uh, <laughs> a great, great ally, great public servant. Thank you. Speaker is in the house. <laughs> uh, and to Majority Leader Assemblywoman Crystal People Stokes, who we served in government for many, many years together. Thank you. Thank you. Our Minority Leader, Senator Robert Ort. I know your district well. It's part of my old term. Looking forward to delivering. Minority Leader Simon Will Barkley is here as well. Judges from the Court of Appeals have joined us. I thank them for attending this opportunity to tell the world and our nation and our state who we are. Mayor Adams, we've worked together very closely, Mayor Adams, and we have more battles ahead, but fortunately not with each other, but against the challenges we face. And mayors and county executives from all across the state, I thank you for joining us. I also know we have uh, one of the formers in the House, Governor David Patterson. You're called governor for the rest of your life. use a point of personal privilege and make a hometown football call, and that is to acknowledge my own county executive, Mark Polencars, and our mayor, Byron Brown, of the city of Buffalo. Please stand up. Please stand up. Thank you. Thank you. so much this past year. So much. But I think a Super Bowl lies ahead. And good luck to the Giants, too. <laughs> And to my members of my cabinet, these are extraordinary. I want them to stand up, every member of my cam cabinet, because we have pushed you so hard. You have worked so tirelessly, and you are the team that I govern the state with, and I'm so grateful for all the work you do. Let's give a round of applause to the cabinet. <laughs> in the house, let's give a round of applause to labor. and many, many distinguished guests who've traveled here today. You know, my fellow elected officials, it's an honor to be back in this chamber and seeing you. One year ago, I stood here, gave the address. Um, the speaker wasn't here. We had Crystal People Stokes up here. Uh, we had the leader. And I, we spoke to an empty audience. It was extraordinary how far we've come in this one year from that time when I literally had to address empty seats. But I did get a round of applause, not a lot that day, <laughs> from my loyal staff in the back when I announced drinks to go. So they're, they were very happy with that announcement. Uh, people across the state are happy with that announcement, but uh, today I'm looking forward to an enthusiastic opportunity to tell you what we are all about. And today I speak not just directly to all of you, but to the people we have the privilege of serving. My fellow New Yorkers, after three very, very difficult and painful, tragic years, I'm proud to stand here and say that the state of our state is strong, but we have work to do. Last year, in the face of immense hardship and uncertainty, we endured. We prove to the world that when New York gets knocked down, we always, always get back up. And because of that, I'm optimistic about this upcoming year and about the future. Oh, we have some big challenges ahead, but I believe that the fight to do what is right is always 
worth pursuing. And I'm steeled in the knowledge that if we come together in this pivotal moment, and those of us in positions of power do what's needed for the people of New York, our shared potential is limitless. As I said in my inaugural address, when we are united, there's no stopping us. When it comes to the mountains yet to be climbed, we're ready to scale them this year because of the peaks we already summited last year. In 2022, working with our leadership and all of you, we made historic investments to strengthen and upgrade our infrastructure, build a world-class public transit system, create strong public education, confront climate change, fortify our healthcare system, help our small businesses recover from COVID, and spur economic development all across the state. We landed the largest investments in state history, 20 billion from IBM, and $100 billion from Micron, creating 50,000 much needed jobs in upstate New York. We expedited tax cuts to the middle class, gave property tax rebates. We suspended the gas tax when prices at the pump hit record levels. You've passed and I've signed over 840 bills. That was a lot. <laughs> but in response also to tragedy and the spreading plague of gun violence, we strengthened our gun safety laws, which were already the strongest in the nation. When Roe v. Wade overturned, was overturned by the Supreme Court, here in New York, we reaffirmed our commitment that reproductive health care remains a human right. And though we had unprecedented revenues and we were flush with one-time federal aid, and that's thanks to our partners in Washington, starting with Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, our Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and members of our delegation. We also knew on that bright sunny day a year ago that rainy days could be ahead. So we put money away. And looking back, that was clearly the right thing to do because one year later, where we stand now, a majority of economists are predicting a recession. And that's one of the reasons it's clear to me why we will not be raising income taxes this year. And I thank the legislature for being partners when we addressed those challenges in 2022. When I was last here, I spoke at the New York Dream. For generations, people have come from all over the world in search of the American Dream. I'm here today because that dream was realized by my family. And I want more New Yorkers to have access to the same opportunities that my family had. That's what public service is all about. The great Francis Perkins, FDR's labor secretary, once said, a government should aim to give all the people under its jurisdiction the best possible life. That's it. That's the job. That's what we're here to do. And I cannot say here, stand here and say we're done yet. Because even though we've set the table for what should be the most prosperous time in New York history, if New Yorkers don't feel safe in their communities, if they can't afford to buy a home or pay their rent, then the dream stays out of reach for them. And we're already seeing signs of out-migration that we can no longer ignore, something I know all too well from growing up in Western New York, at times when jobs were so hard to find. We cannot let that happen again. But the good news is, it does not have to be that way. What I'll discuss today is a broad overview of key policies that will make New York more affordable, more livable, and safer. So let me tell you just how we plan to do that. My number one priority has always been and always will be keeping New Yorkers safe. And a day has not gone by where I've not been laser focused on this objective. 
Oh, the pandemic caused so much havoc in our state, in our country, in society, and it had a profound effect on public safety. You know, that pervasive unease that wormed its way into our day-to-day -day lives, the social isolation, the economic distress, led to a nationwide, nationwide rise in, in gun crimes and violence that we're still combating. And to respond, what we saw right here in New York, we had to develop new strategies and invest in new programs and strengthen our gun violence prevention laws, passing even stronger ones and closing loopholes like banning ghost guns. And I want to thank our Attorney General for her work on making sure that the red flag laws are executed. We expanded bail eligibility for gun crimes. We had tougher prosecutions of gun trafficking. As I mentioned, the red, the red flag laws. We had over 5,000 extreme risk orders of protection astronomically higher than before. You know what that meant? 8,000, 5,000 people who should not have had a gun because they could have done harm somewhere else were prevented. And that kept innocent people from being hurt. Those are the strategies that are working. We also, after the massacre in my hometown, we raised the age to 21 to buy a semiotic weapon, just common sense. We launched the first in the nation, nine states, first time in history, nine states working on gun trafficking and gun interdiction. That effort took over 10,000 illegal guns off our streets. We tripled our investments in gun violence disruption programs on the street, making, connecting people where they are. And we collaborated with local governments like never before from putting more cops on the subways, working with the mayor, to working to bring down barriers in places like Rochester and Syracuse. So stakeholders are finally working together and our efforts are starting to pay off. Last year, we saw a double digit decrease in both homicides and shootings, but we're still far from pre-pandemic levels. So our work is not done. And there has been no aspect around the discussion of public safety more controversial than bail reform. And as with so much in politics today, the conversation quickly turns to a debate between two opposing camps with no common ground. But I believe there are several things we can agree upon. First, that the size of someone's bank account should not determine whether or not they sit in jail or go home. Even before they've been convicted of a crime. That was the goal of bail reform. It was a righteous one. And I stand by it. Second, bail reform is not the primary driver of a national gun wave or crime wave. It was created by a convergence of factors, including the pandemic, all across the nation. But also, I would say we can agree that the bail reform law as written leaves room for improvement. And as leaders, we cannot ignore that. When we hear so often from New Yorkers that their top concern is crime. And so to my partners in government, in the legislature, let's start with this base of shared understanding and have a thoughtful conversation. Not this, but this and talk about what we can do during the budget process and make improvements to that law. Of course, we know that that won't automatically bring down crime rates. We don't expect that. We also have to make sure the law is clear for our judges and what their rights are and what their expectations are. But at the same time, we're going to continue making rest record investments in areas where it affects the outcomes, education, housing, mental health, all of these go towards stabilizing communities and addressing historic inequities. Those investments must continue. And I'm also proposing the largest investment ever in the state's gun-involved violence elimination initiative known as GIVE. 
It saves lives. It saves lives in the communities hardest hit by gun violence. To simply put it, we're working on investing in what we know works. Shootings in Buffalo are down 32%. Mayor Brown, you know this. You're working hard. In Long Island, they're down 29%. In Westchester, down 27%. These are all give program jurisdictions. We're putting state money to help our locals on the ground. I've also directed our state police to play a more direct role as they started last year. But there's more they can do. We're going to increase the ranks of our state police in combating violent crime across communities. We're going to expand the state police community stabilization units to 25 targeted communities across the state. When it comes to keeping people safe and protecting their well-being, fixing New York State's mental health care system is essential and long overdue. Even before COVID, the rates of mental illness had been on the rise. But since the pandemic, more than one in three New Yorkers have either sought mental health care or know someone who has. That's staggering. And the fact that too many can't get it, the barriers just seem endless. No appointments close to home. Insurance won't cover the care. Long awaits for psychiatric beds in hospitals. What happens? People suffer in silence. Illness grows when it's not treated. So it's no surprise that the number of people suffering from mental illness also continues to grow. We have underinvested in mental health care for so long and allowed the situation to become so dire that it also has become a public safety crisis as well. New Yorkers are anxious on the subways and in our streets when they see individuals who, who need help, people unable to take care of themselves properly, people could cause harm to themselves or other. Not all, just some, a few. But those people are also at risk of being victimized themselves. So I'm declaring the air of ignoring the needs of these individuals is over. Because, because our success as government leaders is measured by our ability to lift up and support all of our constituents. So today marks a reversal in state, the state's approach to mental health care. And this is a monumental shift to make sure that no one else falls to the cracks. This will be the most significant change since the deinstitutionization area of the 1970s. And I'm proud to announce to accomplish this goal, we are prepared to invest $1 billion making critical policy changes to fully meet the mental health needs of our people. It's about time. Let's get it done. We can do this together. Let's get it done. Our people need this. Our residents are calling on us to do this. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. Right now, we have 3,200 New Yorkers struggling with severe mental illness or addiction who are living on the streets or in our subways. At the same time, we have insufficient number of inpatient psychiatric beds and services. We will add 1,000 inpatient psychiatric beds by funding 150 from the state and bringing 850 psych beds and hospitals back online. Because that'll be half. <laughs> that is more than half of the beds we lost since 2014 when all the disinvestment was happening. And they'll serve over 10,000 New Yorkers every year. These actions are long overdue, but here's the challenge. Last year, we were asked to increase hospital reimbursement rates to enable more psychiatric beds to be brought back online. We did that. My partners, all of you, $27.5 million provided an additional money for the hospitals to bring psychiatric beds back online. Yet a year later, hundreds of those beds are still offline. And that's not acceptable. 
so. We're going to insist they come back online, and I'll seek greater authority from the Office of Mental Health to ensure full cooperation in meeting these objectives. This is a moral imperative, and it's a public safety imperative. We'll also invest in services to allow patients to be reintegrated in a way that's safe for them and safe for their community. So our inpatient beds don't get backed up because more appropriate outpatient care is unavailable. We also know that supportive housing is an important tool for prevention and recovery. And that's why my plan proposes building 3,500 residential units supported by intensive mental health services. And we'll make sure that when patients move from one kind of care to the other, they don't get left behind. They don't fall off. Our plan requires facilities to discharge high-risk patients into intensive wraparound services. Wraparound services now. And I'll propose that insurance companies cannot be prohibited from covering these services. They can no longer deny mental health, critical life-saving mental health services. And finally, we're going to focus the mental health space on our children because too many schools provide no level of mental health support. And our children need preventative services now to stop them from needing intensive services in the future. We aim to meet this unpet need and reduce it by half over the next five years. We've got to get this done. And while we're talking, whether we're talking about a child with behavioral challenges or an adult suffering from severe depression, no one should go without a screening or a doctor's appointment or counseling. And cost should never, ever be a barrier. And that includes those suffering from addiction, especially those struggling with opioids. There's too many families, including my own, who've endured the loss of a loved one. And that's why we'll do more working with our federal and local partners to stop the flow of illicit drugs into our communities, address the new deadly additives like xylazine. We'll send resources to communities that are trying hard to shut down the flow of fentanyl into our streets. And we'll keep expanding access to technology so they can detect deadly additives like fentanyl and xylazine before they're even used. That's how you save lives and we can reverse overdoses. And I'll create a new interagency task force that'll examine every single possible solution and come up with recommendations. Because we must meet this crisis with the urgency that it demands. Yet at the outset, I said we have to work on improving the quality of life for New Yorkers. But you can't really talk about improving someone's quality of life when they're struggling with the cost of living. Inflation soaring, prices going up on everything that families need to buy for their kids, diapers, formula, sneakers. And on top of that, how do you pay the monthly rent or the mortgage? It's just so overwhelming for our families. So we'll talk now about everyone's largest expense, housing. And I think about my own family's story. My family started married life in a trailer park. On my dad's salary, they eventually moved to an upstairs flat, tiny, but held a few other kids. They had a few more kids. And they eventually moved to a tiny Cape Cod. But as we grew older, my dad changed jobs. I watched my parents' success unfold to the progression of homes they could afford. And they also knew how important housing was. They raised us to fight for change. My parents were activists back in the 60s. A lot of marches, a lot of protests. And they volunteered for an organization called Housing Opportunities Made Equal, which had just started back then. And I assure you that where I lived, it was a very controversial thing to do. 
But my parents said everybody has the right to live where they want, and they understood for a society to reach its full potential, equal access to housing is a must. Because when there's not sufficient housing, people at all income levels struggle. And if things get bad, they leave. They search for opportunities elsewhere. Over the last decade, New York State has created 1.2 million jobs. That's great. But only built 400,000 houses. Many forces led to this state of affairs, but front and center are local land use policies that are the most restrictive in the nation. Through zoning and local communities are able to hold enormous power to block growth. Between full bans on multifamily housing and onerous zoning and approval processes, they make it difficult, almost impossible, to build new homes. Think about that. People want to live here. They have jobs here. But because of local decisions to limit growth, they cannot. Local governments can and should make a difference. I spent 14 years in local government. Many of you came through that route as well. And our community had a citizen-driven master plan that allowed for targeted housing and economic growth while preserving green space. So I know this can be done, but it hasn't been. Between 2010 and 2018, Nassau, Suffer, Suffolk, Westchester, Putnam counties, each granted fewer housing permits per capita than virtually all the suburban counties in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Southern California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Northern Virginia. When it comes to New York City, other metro areas are creating housing at two to four times the rate that we are. Boston rate is almost double. Washington, D.C., triple. Seattle, four times. So with less supply, demand drives up prices, and who gets squeezed? Young families starting out, middle-income families looking to move up, low-income families. People can't even get the starter home anymore. That's why, since becoming governor, housing has been front and center of my agenda. The budget that we worked on together, we passed it. A five-year, $25 billion plan to create and build 100,000 affordable homes. That's the single largest housing investment in our state's history. We unlocked billions for NYCHA through the creation of the New York City Public Housing Preservation Trust. We created a $25 million eviction prevention legal services program to keep people in their homes and making sure vulnerable renters had the representation they needed in court. We invested $539 million in the Homeowner Assistance Fund. We made $100 million in rent supplements available. So we've done all this together. I want to thank Leader Andre Stewart-Cousins and Speaker Carl Hasty for also prioritizing housing. They know how important this is. They rightly recognize that too many people are struggling just to find a place to call home. And they're looking to us for bold leadership. Decisive action is called for now. Today, I'm proud to introduce the New York Housing Compact, a groundbreaking strategy to catalyze housing development we need for our communities to thrive, for our economy to grow, and our state to prosper. The Compact pulls together a broad menu of policy changes that will collectively achieve the ambitious goal of 800,000 new homes built over the next decade. The Compact sets clear expectations for the growth we need, while at the same time giving localities the tools, the flexibility, and the resources to stimulate that growth. Every single locality across the state will have a target for building new homes. Upstate, the target is for the current housing stock to grow 1% every three years. Believe me, it's very manageable. Downstate, 3% every three years. Many localities are already hitting these goals. 
already hitting these goals. But many others are just falling a little bit short. And for our small towns and villages, just literally a handful of new homes will help us hit our statewide target. But the reality is, there are some communities that need to affect real change to build the homes we need. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Local governments can meet these targets any way they want. They can shape building capacity. They can redevelop old malls, old buildings, office parks, incentivize new housing production, or just update the zoning rules to reduce the barriers. We know this is a big ask, and that's why localities will get help from the state. To accomplish this, we have to get it done. We will offer substantial new funding for infrastructure, for schools, roads, sewers, all needed to support growing communities. And we'll cut the red tape to allow projects to move more quickly while still protecting the health, safety, and environment of our communities. But when communities have not made good faith efforts to grow, when proposed housing projects are languishing for no legitimate reason, the state will implement a fast-track approval process because doing nothing, doing nothing is an abdication of our responsibility to act in times of crisis. The Housing Compact is also laser-focused on transit-oriented development. Now, we all know the MTA is the lifeblood of the New York City metropolitan region, and we'll continue to invest and ensure the MTA's long-term fiscal health. We have to do that. And our investments, our investments in our world-class commuter lines have connected more people to jobs and created vibrant downtowns. And that's why it makes so much sense to build new housing in those same areas. That's what happens in cities across the globe. So as part of my compact, any municipality with a train station will rezone the area within a half a mile to allow for the creation of new housing within the next three years. Finally, we cannot, cannot meet the demand for housing without an incentive program like we have with 421A in New York City. Without it, developers are only building condominiums or build elsewhere, which is absolutely not the result we need to meet our housing goals. We will work with the legislature to come up with a replacement for this critical piece of the puzzle. We have to. Overall, this plan is ambitious, but that's what New Yorkers expect from their leaders. Today I say no more delay, no more waiting for someone else to fix this problem. Housing is a human right, and ensuring, <laughs> and ensuring enough housing is built is how we protect that right. The saying is, Never let a good crisis go to waste, and we will not waste this opportunity. We just need everyone and every community to do their part so people who want to live here can, and they can afford it. Solving our housing crisis would be a huge step forward in making our state more affordable. But as to be part of a yet a broader approach, homeowners and renters worry about paying their energy bills because rates are at record highs driven by geopolitical forces outside our control, but hitting our wallets right here at home. In this winter, we're facing energy costs 20 to 30 percent higher than just last year. And that forces so many low-income families and other families to say, do I keep the thermostat up to put food on the table? What a horrible choice. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't help that New York State has the oldest houses in America. Some of the oldest, for sure. They're less insulated, they're harder to heat, and have higher greenhouse emissions. In fact, buildings are the largest source of greenhouse emissions 
in our state, accounting for one third of our greenhouse gas output. It also stresses the pollution, causes asthma, and endangers our kids. So today I'm proposing another series of proposals to insulate our most vulnerable households from exorbitant energy costs and to clear the path for a more sustainable future. We're calling it the Empower Plus, Plus program, and it'll help low-income families retrofit their homes by adding insulation, upgrading appliances, switching from fossil fuels to clean electric heating systems. And this program will reach tens of thousands of households within a year. And homes that electrify will be eligible for the first in the nation energy affordability guarantee, a promise that they'll never have to spend more than 6% of their income on electricity. We also want to reduce the overall burden on our residents struggling with high electric bills. So we'll be providing at least $165 million in relief for over 800,000 New Yorkers. We know that long-term sustainability for our wallets and for our planet comes from weaning ourselves from fossil fuels. And to set us on that path, I'm proposing a plan to end the sale of new fossil-powered heating equipment by 2030, by calling for construction of all new construction to be zero emission starting in 2025 for small buildings and 2028 for large buildings. And we're taking these steps now because climate change remains the greatest threat to our planet, but also to our children and our grandchildren. In 2019, this legislature instituted aggressive mandates and deadlines for reducing emissions. And now we're executing on that plan. Of course, we must do it thoughtfully in a way that prioritizes affordability, protects those already struggling to get by, and corrects the environmental injustices of the past. And with this in mind, we're pursuing a nation-leading cap and invest program to cap greenhouse emissions, invest in clean energy, and prioritize the health and economic well-being of our families. Big emitters will have to purchase permits to sell polluting fuels. The dirtier the fuel, the bigger the price tag. And the invest part of the program will accelerate the clean energy transition and include universal climate action rebates that will provide over $1 billion the revenue we bring in to allocate to lower utility bills, covered transportation costs, and other decarbonization efforts. That's how we're going to help our New Yorkers. That's how we help New Yorkers get through the transition. And what's great about Cap and Invest, it gives us great flexibility so we can focus our efforts on the biggest polluters and at the same time ensure our families, our farmers, our small businesses aren't crushed by the costs. And we'll help families with energy costs transition to the future because we know that future belongs to our kids. And as the first mother to lead this state, I know firsthand I know firsthand what the lack of affordable child care can do to a family. But as a governor, I also know the impact on our state's economy. More than 35 years ago, when I was a young staffer working for Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, I loved my job. But there were no affordable child care options available to my family. So I put my career on hold, raised a family, and so often we know it's the moms, in particular, who are forced to make these decisions. And with that experience, I was so proud we worked together last year to announce $7 billion over four years to focus on affordable child care in our budget. We work together to get it done. And thank you. Thank you. We brought down 
We brought down out-of-pocket costs for more families. We expanded care in areas that were severely lacking. You know what the problem is? Too many families just aren't accessing the resources that are available. Believe it or not, only 10% of families who are eligible for child care assistance are actually enrolled. Now, it may be that it's the legacy of a system that was, by design, difficult to navigate. That has to change. Our plan will streamline and centralize the child care application process. We'll also expand more access to vulnerable families. We'll increase income eligibility for more families to be able to take advantage of this as their incomes increase. But also we have to continue supporting our hardworking, unbelievable health child care providers who allow us all to get done what we need to do. They're indispensable, <laughs> indispensable. Now we talk about affordability, we talked about a lot today. But if we really want to continue to tackle the affordability crisis head on, we must recognize that the low-wage workers that we represent across this state, rural, suburban, urban, we're all over, they've been the hardest hit by inflation. The average cost of goods and energy for low-income households jumped over 13% over two years, and they were barely making it before. This pushes our families already on the margins to the breaking point. So as a matter of fairness, social justice, I'm proposing a plan to peg the minimum wage to inflation. If cost goes up, costs go up, so will wages. So will wages. Thank you. Thank you. Our families deserve this. Okay. And like other states that have implemented this policy, we'll put on guardrails to make sure employers, the increase are predictable for them. I understand this. We also need to have flexibility in the event of a recession. But this important change will give over 900,000 minimum wage workers a lifeline. And these workers are most likely to be women. Many times, moms, the struggles are so great. And they're more likely to be people of color, earning the lowest wages in our state. By putting more money back in their pockets, it helps our economy overall because it goes back into local businesses and services when they go to the stores. It's how you keep things going. These initiatives and policies, investments and new approaches are just the tip of the iceberg. But I've kept you long enough. What you've heard from me today are just some of my top priorities as we improve the lives of New Yorkers. But this is no way an exhaustive list. In fact, I know most of you cannot wait to read the 275-page book, <laughs> containing 147 thoughtful policy proposals. Uh, thank you, Michael Asher, and my dream team, and my entire cabinet for helping make that happen. <laughs> Watch out for my staff in the hall. They haven't had any sleep. They're likely to bang into you. <laughs> They're exhausted. They've worked so hard on this, and I thank them. I'm grateful. But to recap, my goals are straightforward and clear. We will make New York safer. We will make New York more affordable. We will create more jobs and opportunities for the New Yorkers of today and the New Yorkers of tomorrow. We'll open up the doors to more people and communities, especially those who have been historically blocked from equal chances at success. And as other states slide backwards when it comes to protecting basic fundamental rights, we will continue to enshrine and protect those rights every single day. And we'll continue to be nation leading. The task ahead of us may sound daunting. The stakes could not be higher. But I'm fortunate to live in a home once occupied by 
one of our great leaders and thinkers named Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, you who are going to build a new world must go forward with courage. We will build a new world and we will be courageous. We will do the hard things, the necessary things to lift up and support New Yorkers and clear a path for them to realize the New York dream. That is my promise to the people of New York. And I will work with the members of this legislature day in and day out to keep that promise. May God bless the great state of New York and may God bless America. Thank you. Joint session is adjourned. <laughs>